welcome to Young Legal Aid Lawyers first ever remote meeting. Um, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to have you here, um, albeit under quite strange circumstances and scary times for everybody, no doubt. Um, we are joined by four incredible expert speakers. I've got Steve Broach from 39 Essex Chambers. Give us a wave, Steve. Hi, everyone. I've got Bella Sankey from Detention Action. Um, I've got, oh, in fact, sorry, Bella, I think you're muted there. I don't know if you'll appear on anybody's screen while you're muted. Okay, I've unmuted. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. I've got Joe Hines from the Public Law Project. Hi. And I've got uh, Stephen Gallagher Andrew, who's from Garden Court Chambers and also Legal Sector Workers United. Hi. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, for all the attendees, I just wanted to go through some preliminary points. As you will have already seen on Twitter, the hashtag that we're using today is hashtag virtual. So do tweet any comments and anything you want to say about um, tonight's event there. Um, in terms of actual questions for the event, you should have at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. So please enter all your questions into the Q&A. I will moderate questions. Now, depending on how many we have, um, I don't know if we'll be able to necessarily answer every question. So my apologies in advance for that, but we will try to answer them as fully as possible and certainly the majority of them. If I'm not answering your question and you're unhappy about it, please don't tell me, <laughs> um, but, do, uh, but do leave feedback, obviously. Um, so other things as well, we are going to record the event. Now, if I, that won't affect attendees at all because you're not on screen, but if you would like your name to be or remain anonymous, then please don't include it in your question and then it will remain anonymous. Um, details of Zoom privacy statements and all that sort of thing are available on the YLR website on the meetings page. So do have a look there. Um, we've included links and basically plagiarized PLPs privacy statement on Zoom, uh, but it is all there anyway for you to, to have a look at. Um, other little bits as well, um, I'm just going to check my notes just to make sure that I've got everything covered. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's the main, that's the main stuff, okay. Um, we are going to have um, speakers speaking about various topics. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have questions for each individual speaker, and then just general thoughts at the end. Um, that's how we kind of intend to run it. I hope that's all right with all of you. Um, first, and well, first I should have said, really, uh, we owe a huge debt of gratitude today to Steve Broach and the guys at 39 Essex Chambers for setting this up and allowing us to use their Zoom facilities. So we're really, really grateful to you guys. Thank you for that. I couldn't think of a better cause. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think that is about everything and we're good to get going. Um, just as a little bit of context from the YLAL side, um, no doubt, I mean, we've got at the moment 192 participants. This is just fantastic. I think it's our biggest meeting yet. Um, you will have also seen yesterday that we released our report, our COVID-19 report, and we had a whopping 309 responses to our survey. Um, it's, it makes for, it's an important read, it's a difficult read. Um, obviously people talk about the issues for their practice, their fears going forward in this pandemic, and also the impact on their clients. Hopefully all of that to one extent or another will be covered um, tonight actually. Um, we've got insights into legislative changes, um, possible challenges. We've also got um, an insight into remote working and access to justice. So um, it's actually quite timely, I, I, I suspect. Anyway, without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Steve Broach. I'm just going to do a very, very short introduction. I hope you don't mind this, Steve. Um, Steve sure. is a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers, um, which he just recently moved to, and um, is a foremost discrimination lawyer. Um, and actually, I was looking through, um, Steve, your list of um, notable cases, and it's pretty impressive, actually. <laughs> um, showing off, don't worry about it. <laughs> 
Um, but in particular, um, Article 14, indirect discrimination for yeah. the law students among us, that will be of, of key interest. And I know you're going to talk to us a little bit today about the Coronavirus Act and some of your kind of ongoing work during this pandemic. So I'll leave it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much, Kiara. Uh, really pleased to be here, everyone. I hope you can hear and, and reasonably see me. I think this is my uh, my Wailau debut. So as, as an old legal aid lawyer, I'm delighted to be here with, with all you young legal aid lawyers. Um, I've always been a massive admirer of the work that Wailau's done since, since it was set up and uh, a fantastic report today as well. Very sobering, as Kiara says. Uh, I hope that in the next 15 minutes or so I can <clears throat> give some support and some encouragement to people who are thinking, well, at the moment, how are we supposed to do this? It's, it's, it's hard enough being a legal aid lawyer at the best of times and, and at the worst of times like we're in now, how on earth are we actually supposed to get anything done? And, and I'm going to try and announce that by reference to some real life examples of work that we've already done since the crisis started to break, uh, in particularly in, in the area that I practice most often in, which is around uh, disabled people's rights, the rights of children and young people and, and older adults uh, who are disabled as well. Uh, I'm going to give three examples actually of um, guidance that we've already managed to get changed as a result of the threat of judicial review um, with legal aid lawyers acting um, in those cases and uh, where we've achieved real successes already in terms of um, preventing the worst excesses of what's happening at the moment in terms of the erosion of people's rights in the name of the national emergency. Don't you know there's a virus on, as has been said. And I'm going to try and do something a bit nifty now and share my screen, making sure I've closed my emails. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a bit husky because I just did a two hour webinar as a warm up for this, which is a bit excessive uh, as I'm now discovering. So I hope people can hear me okay. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully what you can see is uh, the NICE guideline on uh, access to critical care. Now, if you're a disabled person at the moment, one of the things that is likely to be very concerning to you and your family members is whether you're going to be treated in the event that you are unfortunate enough to get the virus or otherwise need to be admitted to hospital at this time. And NICE, um, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, uh, inevitably was, was required to publish a, a guideline, some guidance on how to manage critical care in adults, as it's now, uh, now called. It, was, it wasn't initially so subscribed, but it's now uh, expressly referred to adults. And you'll see it was published on the 20th of March, but then updated, and this is the important point. Because when the guideline first came out, what it said was that on admission to hospital, everyone, all adults now, will be assessed for frailty. And frailty is a concept that was developed in relation to the care of elderly people. And uh, the use of the clinical frailty scale, or the CFS, was initially um, applied to everyone. And if we look quickly at the CFS, it should be here, there we go. We can see, and it's quite short, so it won't take me too long to show you, that it's a scale that goes from very fit at one end down to terminally ill at the other. And the key cutoff point is five on the scale, because anyone who's five or above was assessed as being in a frail group and therefore potentially, it appeared under the guideline, um, would be less likely to be able to access intensive care if, if they were became unwell as a result of the virus. And the real problem was, the way that seven is described, so that's obviously quite high, is that the person will be completely dependent in relation to personal care from whatever cause, physical or cognitive. And so many disabled people who are completely dependent on others for provision of personal care to them felt, well, I'm going to fall into that seven rung on the scale and therefore I'm going to be assessed as frail and that means that I may not get treatment. So there was obviously a huge amount of concern. And um, with uh, Peter Todd at Hodge Jones Allen, um, we um, sent a letter before action on behalf of clients who were so concerned to NICE. And the result of that was that the guidance was amended. And so the current guidance, as we see, very clearly states the CFS should not be used, the clinical frailty scale should not be used in younger people, people with stable long term disabilities, learning disabilities, or autism. An individualized assessment is recommended in all cases. And so quite quickly, the um, concern that this scaled approach that wasn't designed for disabled adults, uh, working age adults at least, uh, would be applied to them inappropriately was, was taken away. Although, of course, the problem with these kinds of issues 
is that not everyone gets the update or not everyone understands that things have changed. And so there's still a misconception that somehow the CFS is relevant to the, the group of younger disabled people when the NICE guidelines now expressly state that it's not. So that was the first of the, the disability rights uh, related successes. And one thing that's common to the, um, the positive stories I'm going to tell tonight is the, the, the important role that social media plays in all this now. I think uh, if we'd had this crisis five years ago, even certainly 10 years ago, the ability to respond to it would have been so much less than, than it is now. Because the way in which Twitter in particular allows for disabled people, family members, advocates, activists, lawyers to network, it's quite astonishing. And how quickly we were able to pick up this problem, um, identify the concern, clients were able to come to Peter and I we were able to send a letter before claim very quickly. It just wouldn't have been able to happen in a, in a different situation where uh, the, the networks, the social media networks weren't there. So that, that was the first um, very successful uh, intervention, I'd suggest. The second was into, uh, <laughs> takes us straight onto the um, Coronavirus Act. Now, those who haven't had the misfortune to look at the act already uh, will not see that it covers a huge range of life. Uh, and in, in the areas that I work in, in particular, Schedule 12 of the Coronavirus Act uh, suspends many of the duties in relation to adult social care, which is, is hugely problematic, and we might want to talk about more in questions. But Schedule 17 of the Coronavirus Act allows the Secretary of State to make a notice which will uh, modify or disapply some of the key provisions in relation to special educational needs, in particular Section 42 of the Children and Families Act, which is the duty to secure provision. So if a child has an, an education, health and care plan at the moment, uh, they are entitled as a matter of right to all the provision that's set out in, in section F, which is the educational provision, section G, which is the health provision. And that entitlement remains until the Secretary of State makes a notice. So it's very unusual provision in, in the schedule to the Coronavirus Act that allows the Secretary of State to modify primary legislation through, through making a notice. He hasn't made that notice yet. But you wouldn't have realized that if you'd read the first draft of this guidance, because when this guidance came out initially, and again, you see it's been updated, it strongly suggested, in our view at least, that um, local authorities were already entitled to not comply with the duty under Section 42 and to treat it as it would become under the modified form if the notice is made, a, a reasonable endeavours duty. And so we challenged this uh, guidance as well and a letter for claim was sent and a uh, response was received denying the claim but at the same time uh, the government did amend the guidance and we can see what it says now is that the coronavirus act allows the secretary of state where appropriate to temporarily lift the statutory duty with local authorities needing instead to apply reasonable uh, endeavors as such where the secretary of state has issued a temporary notice they won't be penalized if they don't do it making it clear, or at least reasonably clear, that he hasn't done that yet, which was the key point that we were trying to make. And so um, that's made even more clear, we'd say at 22, the Coronavirus Act will help the government respond to the outbreak. The legislation gives the Secretary of State powers to provide for more flexibility. Again, but that hasn't happened yet. Any changes made would only remain in place temporarily. Um, so the guidance has now been reflected to reflect amended to reflect the law but again a lot of damage has been done and we've already seen examples of local authorities telling families oh no we've no, we don't have to arrange that therapy provision anymore we don't have to put in place that support because the laws changed and the coronavirus act has, has come in uh, completely ignoring the amendment that to the guidance that reflects the uh, the actual position so that's the uh, the second success although um somewhat qualified by the fact that um the guidance had done a lot of its damage already. Now, the third uh, issue onto the flag in the limited time available is probably the most controversial because it has to do with um, the way in which the guidance addresses the very controversial question of um, the regulations which prohibit people from leaving their home. So, under Regulation 6 of the, of the coronavirus regulations, uh, we are all required to remain in the place that we live unless uh, we have a reasonable excuse not to be in that place and um, it's necessary for us to leave and the regulations give a, a non-exhaustive list of purposes for which we are potentially uh, able to say that we have a reasonable excuse. Now th that's fine and the regulations are quite broadly drawn. Uh, what isn't fine, certainly from the perspective of many of my clients, is what the guidance says and the guidance you see here, paragraph one, addressing the key question of when am I allowed to leave the house, says you should only leave the house for very limited purposes. 
uh, but in particular says one form of exercise a day, for example, a run walk, or cycle alone or with members uh, of your household. And that's been interpreted by many people, including it appears some police forces, as meaning you're only allowed to go out once to exercise. And that was hugely problematic for many uh, people with autism, for example, uh, those with mental health conditions who significantly benefit from exercise out of doors uh, and a whole host of other um, clients with additional needs. And that blanket policy of, of one form of exercise a day seemed to us to be um, obviously indirectly discriminatory to pick up a, a thing from Kiara's introduction because it was a blanket policy that had a disproportionate adverse effect on uh, the cohort of disabled people in a way that couldn't be justified. And so Bindman's uh, picked this case up, uh, Emma Varley and, and Jamie Potter there, amazing work to get a letter before came out on behalf of two disabled children through their um, parents. And there's a really helpful press release on the, on the Bindman's website that explains the claim. And the, the bit of the talk that's uh, hot off the press, and I can show you this because it's in the public domain, is that the response to the letter before claim today um, flagged up that the government has amended the guidance. And so although paragraph one still says one form of exercise a day, doesn't actually say you can only exercise once, paragraph uh, 15 has been inserted addressing the particular question that we were raising. Can I exercise more than once a day if I need to due to a significant health condition? And it's worth reading this in full. You can leave your home for medical need. If you or a person in your care has a special health condition that requires you to leave the home to maintain your health, including if that involves travel beyond your area, then you can do so. And the specific example that we've been, uh, we were arguing about, this could, for example, include where individuals with learning disabilities or autism require specific exercise in an open space two or three times a day, ideally in line with a care plan agreed with a medical professional. Even in such cases, of course, people should still be doing everything they can to maintain social distancing and reduce the spread of infection. So there, there are lots of bits of the wording of this that I'm not desperately happy about. And certainly I can imagine lots of autistic people would um, struggle and be rather offended with the idea that they have a significant health condition. But in practical terms, we have at least got acknowledgement from uh, the official guidance um, that people may need to exercise more than once a day and that that can be a reasonable excuse in effect for leaving the home, which I'd suggest is a hugely important win for, um, for this particular cohort of people, but also for the principle that just because we have a public health emergency, and I don't say that lightly, we do have a public health emergency, which needs hugely um, significant steps to be taken to address it. But that alone doesn't mean that we can ride roughshod over the rights of vulnerable groups. And here's a win, I would suggest that really does exemplify that, that there's been acceptance that a one size fits all approach is not appropriate here. And that uh, for some disabled people, um, there needs to be uh, a more, a slightly more generous entitlement than the rest of the population will require. So I hope those three quick examples um, give some sucker to everyone on, on, on this webinar, to all of those who are involved in trying to support um, our clients, inevitably those working in legal aid, our clients will be in a rather unpleasant term, vulnerable in, in one way or another, will have needs that are different from the majority of the population. And what I think we're beginning to show is that the law still recognises that and that there are ways in which legal remedies can be used to um, support those, those groups and to make sure that their rights aren't ignored uh, at this incredibly difficult time. So I'll stop talking at that point, I'll stop sharing my desktop and I'll hand back to Chiara to be the next speaker. Well, thank you very, very much for that, Steve. Um, we have, we've got a few questions there, all from the same person, from Nima Daniel. Um, what I'm going to propose is, because we haven't had a huge amount of questions, what we'll do is move through the speakers and just see sure. how things develop. Um, so I hope that's okay with everybody. It's no offence to you at all, Nima, either. And um, we will return to your question at the end. Um, so then moving on to Bella Sankey, who is the Director of Detention Action, who have been incredibly busy over the last three weeks, um, and necessarily so, actually. Um, and I know Bella's going to talk to us a little bit about their high, high court action and their campaign. Um, generally, uh, I should say detention um, action 
is um, a support service and also a campaigning organisation on behalf of immigration det uh, detainees. It's worth noting that immigration detainees are not um, necessarily in custody because they've committed crimes. Some are awaiting deportation, but the vast majority are not. They're just there because of their immigration status. And so Detention Action have long campaigned um, to end the indefinite detention of those people. So I'll pass over to you, Bella, to tell us more about your work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kiara, and to um, uh, Young Legal Aid lawyers and to all of you that have joined us on this sunny evening. It's really great to be speaking with um, so many um, allies and um, legal aid lawyers that are doing such sterling work in the most difficult of circumstances. Um, yes, we've been busy over the last few weeks. So my organisation, as Kiara says, we support people in immigration detention. Uh, we, we go into... Um, two of the biggest detention centres in the UK, the Heathrow centres, um, Harmonsworth and Colnbrook every fortnight in normal circumstances. We have an advice line that, that detainees can call um, from those centres and also from Morton Hall up in Lincolnshire. Um, and we also support people that are detained under immigration powers in London prisons. Um, so normally at any one time, there's about 400 to 500 people detained in prison under immigration powers post completing their sentence, uh, but people can be detained there for really long periods. As you all know, immigration detention is indefinite. Um, so th those are the support services that we provide. We don't give legal advice, but we do make a lot of legal referrals, as you would expect, and also referrals to other specialist organisations like medical justice and others, depending on the needs of clients. Uh, and we offer often very long term support to people that are detained for long periods of time. It became really apparent to us around early March as it was kind of slowly dawning on us all, I think, just the severity and um, impact that this virus was going to have, uh, that in immigration detention, people were highly vulnerable. And based on previous conduct of the Home Office and the government with respect to, to, to these people, um, they were probably going to be kind of last in the pecking order in terms of support and protective measures. Um, so we started building our case, we instructed Duncan Lewis and Chris Butler and Aisha Christie at Matrix Chambers, who have been hugely supportive over the last uh, three to four weeks. And we built our case partly based on um, testimony from clients. So we started getting daily calls from people who were watching the news and saying, hang on, we, you know, we've, we've heard about this virus. Um, I've got a condition that sounds as though it could mean I'm more at risk, I'm asthmatic or I'm diabetic or I've only got one kidney or, you know, very many uh, people in detention do have COVID comorbidities. Uh, and, the, and clients were telling us that they were seeing stuff on the news and, you know, 24 seven on the news, but they hadn't been given any information by the IRCs as to what was going on. They'd been told that there'd been a flu outbreak in Harmonsworth and given advice on how not to catch the flu. But it seemed for very many weeks that officers were, were obviously being instructed not to mention COVID at all uh, and, and not to even answer people's really reasonable questions. One thing people may no, not be aware of, and indeed I wasn't aware of until we started um, trying to build this case, was that uh, the Home Office doesn't and IRCs don't provide soap in detention centres. I mean, that's the level of, of, of hygiene and um, care, you know, that, that, that isn't provided. Um, detainees are expected to buy soap from the shop. We were hearing that soap was running out. There was no hand sanitizer in the shops. Um, and um, detainees are also expected to do the bulk of their own cleaning. So detention centre staff don't clean the detention centres. Detainees do. Um, but they weren't being given cleaning products. So they were going and asking, you know, I want to clean my cell, I want to clean the communal areas, there were no cleaning products. And this was across the detention state. We started taking calls from women at Yarls Wood um, and, and, and people at the Gatwick centres as well. And it was the same picture everywhere, although they're run by different private companies and, and Morton Hall still by the state, it was, clear, it was very clearly the same picture. Um, and initially, when journalists were approaching the Home Office, they were just being told, uh, we're working to ensure a sufficient supply of soap, um, <laughs> thereby revealing that soap isn't ordinarily um, provided. Uh, and that really seemed to be the Home Office's holding line. That was the only action that they were taking uh, to protect people in detention against the virus. 
Um, we filed our claim and on the eve of our hearing, which was now two weeks ago today, we received quite a lot of disclosure from the Home Office, including things that they've clearly done since we filed. Um, and among those things, and, and, and in terms of the undertakings that were given in response, they said that they would um, review the case of everybody in detention, both people in IRCs and also uh, held under detention powers in prisons, with a view to making releases. They said that they'd already made 350 releases from detention. Um, they disclosed a list of 49 countries that the UK cannot, well, could not at that point, two weeks ago, remove people to. Um, and they said that they would not be detaining people from, uh, that were removable to that list of countries unless they considered them to be a high harm individual. Um, so those were essentially the undertakings they gave. They said that in terms of doing their case reviews, they would be prioritizing people with COVID comorbidities and also people that had already been accepted as being adults at risk levels three and two, and then kind of work from the, the, the highest priority through everybody. And they gave some idea of timeline. They seemed to indicate that they would get through the vulnerable cohort of detainees um, that week and then they would move on to everybody else. Um, we, our, our hearing two weeks ago was an um, interim relief hearing um, and we were unsuccessful. The High Court um, was clearly very much persuaded by the very reasonable steps that the Home Secretary was putting into place and gave her quite a lot of latitude um, you know, obviously referencing how unprecedented the situation is uh, and that it's changing and it's very fluid um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and declined our application, which was, um, uh, you know, unfortunate, perhaps not unsurprising, given how much the Home Office seemed to have moved in quite a short space of time, and what they were able to uh, present as being their, their response. Um, since then, two weeks ago, we know that lots and lots of you have been doing bail applications uh, that have been astoundingly successful. So we heard from BID today that they've had 23 bail applications since lockdown. All of them have been successful. Um, and we're hearing from other solicitors that we work with all the time, similar things, which is really encouraging. We also know from our clients that the Home Office is continuing to make more releases. So there, there is obviously some sort of review going on and people are being released every day which again is incredibly encouraging um, but but our sense is that situation is very patchy and um, that the systems are not working effectively because we know that there are still hundreds of people in detention we know there are still very many people that are very vulnerable in detention um, and so we wrote to the Home Secretary earlier this week with a list of 22 of our clients who have who are still in detention have COVID comorbidities or are adults at risk levels three and two, um, asking them, you know, if, you, if, if it is the case that you have conducted your review and you've prioritised the people in this group, why are these people still in detention? Um, and so we're currently negotiating timescales with the Home Office, but we're certainly not defeated yet um, and we're determined to get more people release from detention quite frankly the way that this virus is going um i would be surprised if anyone's detention is lawful at the moment and um, we haven't heard of people being removed for at least two weeks um, and i don't really see how you could safely remove anybody in these circumstances particularly given the news today confirmed that there's now a, a positive case of covid19 in brook house um, this is somebody that was brought into the detention centre on the 2nd of April, so well into the pandemic, well into lockdown, well into social distancing. Seems the Home Office is not following government guidance. Um, and this person, we believe, was bought from prison. So that's another thing we've been hearing in the last few weeks, that there's been quite a big movement of individuals held under immigration powers in prison into the detention estate. I think that's really worrying given the scale of the outbreak in prisons um, that, that, that we currently know about. Um, so the idea that you're moving large groups of people from the prison population into another uh, detained setting uh, is just frankly um, uh, pretty scandalous and outrageous. Um, so yeah, we, we, we definitely fight on. Uh, so far we haven't been successful in the courts, but we do think that we've managed to shift government quite significantly. 
um, in terms of their response. And I think it's a question of as much pressure being applied at as many levels, both in terms of individual cases, the strategic case, um, and, and obviously the kind of wider campaign. Steve mentioned social media, and I think that's been really key um, in terms of our success and being able to network with lawyers and members of the public who are concerned and wanting to, to put pressure on as well. Brilliant, thank you so much for that, Bella. And I know I've seen you active on Twitter today with uh, Pretty Patel, <laughs> um, yeah, not giving her any leeway. <laughs> um, you're doing some really fantastic work, thank you so much. Um, I'm not gonna ask you, there are questions building up now in the Q&A, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna ask them all now. I'm gonna let them kind of build up to the end if that's all right with everybody. Um, I'm gonna move on now uh, to Joe Hines from the Public Law Project who is a research fellow there and who is looking particularly at um, remote hearings and access to justice. And it will be of interest to a lot of people um, who contributed to the report, actually, because we had 20% of our respondents are public lawyers and 15% are immigration lawyers. And those are two particular sectors that Joe's looking at. Um, PLP at the moment are still, I believe, Joe, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but calling for evidence about people's experience of remote hearings. Yeah. Yeah, so please do go onto the PLP website, complete those surveys. They are absolutely invaluable at a time like this. Um, and I'll pass over to you, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Well, thanks so much, Wylel, for inviting me here, and to Steve and Bella for their incredibly interesting presentations. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Joe Hines, as Kira says. I'm a research fellow at the Public Law Project, um, and I'm looking at issues of remote justice there. Uh, I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, where I explore immigration bail hearings and video technology. Um, so what I want to explore in my 10 odd minutes is firstly um, some key trends about procedural developments across jurisdictions uh, that the user experience survey uh, PLP has been running has highlighted. And then I want to look specifically at the immigration tribunals, which is the site of my own PhD research and I think ties in really well with what Bella has been saying. So we began circulating a brief survey to court users almost three weeks ago now. Um, and so far we've had over 65 responses, I think today. Um, so if anyone here has experiences, good or bad, uh, of using courts and tribunals recently, particularly if you've used uh, remote hearings, either telephone or video, please do complete the survey. Um, you can find it on the Public Law Project website. So I'm just gonna outline four common themes we're seeing so far. Firstly, there's been a lot of confusion around whose responsibility it is to arrange a remote hearing and also to pay the costs of it. Um, so HMCTS, their guidance states that it's the responsibility of, of HMCTS to do this, of, this, of a particular court. Um, but that doesn't seem to have been everyone's experience, um, which is particularly concerning for litigants in person. Um, secondly, there's been significant obstacles presented by poor quality live video and audio links which to some extent perhaps is to be expected um, despite being wholly undesirable. Um, and some responses did note that they recognise the behind the scenes work going on to address these issues, um, particularly at a time of crisis. Also with the video and audio links, uh, the last minute confirmation from HMCTS about whether hearings were going to be adjourned, whether they were going to take place by video link or telephone and what kind of platform that was going to look like. Um, that was an issue for many people, particularly in the Social Security Tribunal. Um, and this meant it was really difficult to get the tech in place at the claimant side before the hearing, which really disrupted proceedings and meant some had to be adjourned, which is not ideal. Um, and then thirdly, many expressed concerns about how open justice was being maintained. Um, so several responses highlighted the lack of press or public presence um, and they were unsure how public observers would even be able to access hearings. Um, I've been trying to contact the administrative court all week to remotely observe hearings. Um, but this is a little difficult because the cause lists aren't always released with much notice and you have to cite a specific case that you want to observe, which is obviously very different from just wandering into a, a court or tribunal and popping into a courtroom. Um, so this is a massive gap in the current response. They seem to have a better approach to journalists, particularly accredited journalists, but in terms of researchers or public observers, um, that's been a massive gap um, so far at least. Uh, and finally, people expressed concern about future backlogs of cases. Um, so we saw this 
potentially as being a result from both the adjournment of cases now um, and potentially by a future wave of appeals of decisions made during the current sets of guidance. So that's a potential future problem. So that's a brief overview of our survey responses so far um, and thanks to everyone who's contributed to or shared the survey and I would urge you to continue doing so because new issues arise as the situation develops. You know initially a lot of responses were talking about the lack of hand washing facilities in courts which is obviously terrible and now we're hearing more about the remote hearing so we are continuing to monitor uh, developments uh, that the survey throws up. So now specifically looking at the immigration tribunals as with every jurisdiction, there's been a deluge of guidance notes and new ways of working remotely. Um, a pilot practice direction of 19th of March informs us that the hearing should be conducted in the Immigration Tribunal remotely, um, where it's reasonably practicable and in accordance with the overriding objective to do so. So there's a big presumption of a shift towards remote hearings. I won't outline the procedural changes here, partly because there's so many um, and partly because inevitably I'll miss something out because it changes so quickly. But Free Movement has a really helpful update blog post about practice changes in the immigration tribunals, which I'd urge people to look at if they haven't already. So I want to talk about the immigration tribunal specifically um, because I think there are things that we can learn about the tribunal's use of remote hearings with vulnerable appellants before this pandemic. Um, that are really useful for thinking about how remote hearings affect vulnerable appellants in any jurisdiction using remote hearings now. So there's an interesting discussion to be had about who is rendered more vulnerable by the use of remote hearings. And I think we all are to some extent because it's just not how we're used to communicating. Um, and perhaps we'll have time to explore that later in questions. But, but thinking about the specific vulnerabilities or systemic barriers that some people experience more than others, I think is helpful. So my research into immigration bail hearings po points to multiple possible vulnerabilities or potential barriers, um, including being unrepresented, needing an interpreter, being detained, particularly in a prison, um, or being presented in court via video link. Um, but what, what's important here in this current context, I think, is that with the use of remote hearings, not only are all the traditional barriers to accessing justice exacerbated, um, but they also interact and snowball in new ways. Plus there's new barriers, uh, such as having a quiet private space at home with fast Wi-Fi. Um, and this is particularly important in the immigration tribunal where a lot of hearings are, include a lot of very sensitive information, particularly emotionally charged, um, and having kids running around or being in um, refugee support accommodation is not an ideal setup for a, a hearing, which is an incredibly important part of uh, of your process, of a legal process. Um, so take for example, um, and this is a scenario I've observed, um, an immigration bail applicant who's been detained in a prison, um, so might find it more difficult to access legal representation. Um, and then without legal representation, the applicant might find it more difficult to ensure that the interpreter that they need in the hearing offers simultaneous interpretation. Um, and then throw in a remote setting and it becomes very difficult for the applicant to remain fully engaged with their hearing. And research shows us that this leads to less favorable outcomes for applicants. So I think the question of how we frame barriers to access to justice takes on a whole new form in remote hearings and um, because of this interaction of factors. Um, and that's not something we've had much of a chance to consider in the past couple of weeks with this frantic activity, um, but it's certainly worth not losing sight of. So to quickly wrap up, I have a couple of brief recommendations. So firstly, at the minute in the immigration tribunals, we lack the clear published guidance for both judges and parties on how to ensure effective participation in the, in the proceedings. And the public law project amongst others has called for this. So other jurisdictions are demonstrating great best practice. Um, both the Court of Protection and the Family Courts has developed really thoughtful, comprehensive guidance about remote processes in conjunction with their user groups. Um, and we need to see that in the immigration tribunals as well. At the minute, it feels like a, a sort of a shoehorning of the old system into remote settings without really thinking about how that changes the process. Um, so more, more thought needs to be uh, done around that. And secondly, 
Uh, it may just be the case that some categories of hearing, um, particularly those that require testing credibility or testing evidence, are just wholly unsuitable for a remote setup. Um, and that also needs to be built into our approach. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd be really interested in any questions you have later. Thank you. I'll pass thank you, back you to so much for that, Joe. Thank you. And of course, it is, it's so pertinent at the moment, your work. Um, and just today, actually, I was reading a Transparency Project um, article written by a circuit judge um, and actually in the family courts. And they were talking about the difficulties for them and how heavily it weighs um, on everybody involved in the court process, no doubt. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so moving on to our final speaker, Mr. Gallagher Andrew, who um, I'm very fortunate to call a friend, actually. We did pupillage the same year. Um, yeah. So we go way back to 2018. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll pass straight over to you, Steve, and let you introduce yourself, shall I? That's great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all the other speakers. It's, uh, it's been really interesting to listen to what you've got to say. Uh, my name is Steve Gallagher Andrew. Uh, I'm a barrister at Garden Court Chambers in London. Uh, I predominantly practice immigration with a little bit of public law on the side. So, um, well, her from Bella and Joe in particular has been really strikes a chord with me. Uh, however, I am here today in my capacity as a member of the Legal Sector Workers Union. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the union uh, and what that is and what that might be able to do for you. So Legal Sector Workers Union is part of United Voices of the World, and it's a trade union specifically for legal sector workers. Now, it's not just for solicitors, it's also designed for paralegals, caseworkers, clerks, support staff, researchers, cleaners, anyone who falls under the, the broad umbrella of working in the legal sector. Uh, is eligible to join the Legal Sector Workers Union and they're, they're the sort of people that the union wants to attract. Um, also norm, among the number of people that the union wants to attract are self-employed barristers, um, which I'll be honest with you, when it very first started, when the idea was very first floated, I was a bit curious about this because I wasn't quite sure where I fit in as a self-employed barrister with a trade union. You know, I'm, you know, I'm self-employed, I don't have a boss, you know, it, we deal with the legal aid agency. Sometimes you deal with your clerks, but you, you know, you're kind of on your own. Uh, and my, my good friend and colleague, Frank McGinnis was quite, at Garden Court was quite heavily involved in getting this up off the ground. And I ummed and awed about it for a while, but it's largely the COVID-19 crisis that's really sparked my interest in the union. And I've only been a member for about a month or so, but I really see the benefit of being a member of the union, even as a self-employed barrister. Um, and there are three main reasons why I see a benefit for it. Um, first of all, it gives me an opportunity to network and coordinate across skills and qualification divides. So obviously when we're coordinating responses, we are looking at sort of, you know, from the perspective of a worker, but you know, we, we you know, I'm working alongside someone who's a researcher, someone who might be a solicitor, someone who's, you know, sort of in a clerking pool, you know, we're all there and we all have like shared mutual interests. And we're able to cross those sort of skills and professional divides um, and look at what we have in common and how we can support each other. And that kind of brings me on to my second point, really, is, is that it's a point of solidarity. Um, I'm not a, you know, it's really weird the Chamber's set up in the sense that, like, in some respects, you know, you join a partnership and you're kind of indirectly employing people, but not, but then you're not a manager. But still, you know, their, their, their fight is your fight. And sometimes, you know, you want to stand in solidarity with, you know, with your comrades, with your friends, with people who are going through difficult times, you know what I mean? And you want to stand with them, not just in your own chambers, but across the legal sector. And I think that's quite important. And that's something that the union offers. The third thing, and this has only really struck me since I joined the union, and as someone who's worked as a freelancer before, is that what we are as self-employed barristers really, we're, we're, you know, we work in the gig economy, we're gig workers, you know. I know that like, you know, people like, you know, the, 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 the profession likes to throw up this like sort of bravado and like, you know, this like sort of steep mysticism about, you know, the grand barrister with all these grand chambers, whatever it may be, but we're not, man. You know, we're, we're, we're gig workers, especially the junior end, you know. Uh, I, I think I've got it quite good in a chambers that is very good to me, that has been very supportive of me, but I know that I'm, I'm lucky 
I know there are a lot of people at the junior end who, who don't have that, who are really exploited by people who are instructing them, exploited by the clerking pool that, 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 that you know, that, that they get their instructions from, they're people that they are wholly dependent on to put a roof over their heads. And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, we're gig workers, that's what we are. So just to move on briefly to what a legal sector workers union does, as I say, it's a trade union, it represents its workers. And I think that's where it's really important to sort of slot into why it is different from say like, you know, sort of while you know, young legal aid lawyers, or say for example, um, you know, sort of, you know, JCWI, you know, you've got campaigning organizations and you've got membership organizations um, where, say, the, where the union fits in is that it looks at issues from, particularly from a worker's perspective and brings a worker's perspective into the, into the equation. So although the outcomes are very, very similar across different organizations, I think the organization that goes on behind the scenes and the emphasis which is placed upon um, any of the campaigning that, that the, the union does is slightly different. Um, so I'm going to wrap up just by giving you a couple of examples of some of the things that um, you know, the Legal Sector Workers Union have been successful in working on during the sort of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's hard to, hard to remember this, but two weeks ago, just over two weeks ago, we, we weren't in lockdown. You know, we, we had this bonkers situation where the courts were trying to pretend everything was going on as normal. You know, as Bella was talking about earlier on, the try, you know, the, 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 you know, the prisons are trying to say like, you know, this is fine, this is, you know, carrying on as we are. You know, as Joe pointed out, you know, the, the conversation we were having just a couple of weeks ago was about, do we have sanitizer in, in, in you know, in the it's incredible how quickly you know, this has just moved on. But the union was really, really active at that early stage. So like, you know, these were questions about, you know, whether staff had to come into work or not, whether people could work from home, whether they had pay, their conditions, support for non-contracted staff. And, you know, before the furlough came in, and, you know, there was this idea of, you know, the union was quite successful in helping workplaces to organise, to protect their, their, their pay and their conditions. I know of a couple, couple of firms where they tried to reduce staff salaries. They were successful in fighting against that. Uh, they were successful in fighting against, um, uh, you know, sort of layoffs and redundancies. And they were helpful in sort of, bring, you know, threatening or bringing legal action um, against employers that were kind of being slightly unscrupulous. But I think it's also important to point out that, there is, that, that is, this isn't just a sort of them and us mentality. What the union was really good at, in my opinion, was just organising on this flat level. It's not really a hierarchical organisation. So some of the earlier conversations we had along this were... were different people working in different law firms, particularly, not and chambers as well, but talking about what their workplace was doing to accommodate uh, the risk that was posed by the pandemic. And then people sharing ideas of like, oh, well, our place does this, our place does that. How do you do this? How do you do that? So it was a really good means by which people could exchange ideas um, we published some of our guidance on what we thought was good practice and a lot of people went back and got their own change without any need for intervention. Um, so I think that was quite good earlier on. Um, so the second example of something very recent that's come out from the Legal Sector Workers Union uh, comes from where I sit, which is as an immigration barrister. So because it's a flat organisation, you know, the membership take a lot of initiative, you know, to put as much or as little in as they want to. And we have a number of pupils among our number uh, and the pupils within sort of the wider sort of barrister pool uh, were quite concerned about what was going on with their welfare and, you know, how they were going to be protected. So they basically went away, they discussed their own problems and they came up with a pupils protocol, which is an idea of, you know, best practice for chambers in terms of how they deal with pupils, many of whom are about to go on their feet. Um, I mean, it's a year to the day since I, I was on my feet, which is like quite crazy, it's a really weird anniversary, but I still remember how that feels. And I would hate to be going through that sort of anxiety with all of this other stuff hanging over me. But they went away anyway. They created a pupils protocol. It was really, really good. It's picked up by the bar council. And it's become standard practice across the profession. And that's something that came from the union, came from within. And I'm really, really proud of the guys who worked on that. Uh, the second thing that we worked on was like an immigration protocol where in essence we called for the release of all immigration detainees um, 
we approached it from a slightly different perspective, or we tried to, in the sense that because we're a workers' organisation, we try to see it from a you know sort of you know an uh, you know an employment well-being perspective. So we were saying, well, okay, you know, if employers want to look out for the best interests of their employees, then you can't have people going into detention centres. You can't have people going and you know conducting clinics because you know you're fundamentally putting your employees' lives at risk. You know, so we we were because of our nature, we're kind of able to sort of frame it in a slightly different way. As much as we are all predominantly campaigners and we all want the same outcome, we're kind of able to argue it from like a slightly different perspective. So it's a little bit slight, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, and that's kind of got quite a bit of uh, leeway. It's got quite a bit of traction that. So it did get some traction on social media. Uh, I know one of my colleagues, Isaac, was interviewed by Fergal Keane for the BBC, possibly for the Detail programme, and also the, uh, the London Standard. So, um, you know, we've got that out there, and, you know, we approach it from, like, you know, an ethical issue of, you know, representation and safety. So, you know, where are we now? I don't know where we're going to go. No one quite knows what's happening. Um, as a junior barrister, I'm very concerned for my you know, sort of how I'm going to sustain my practice at the moment. I am doing quite a bit of uh, pro bono work, uh, but ultimately that's not going to keep uh, a roof over my head. But I, I assume that's something that we will be sort of campaigning on. And obviously the longer the furlough goes on, the greater the number of issues that work, that, that arise for different people across the sector. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about the union. Um, as I say, I mean, I just echo what, what the others have said in terms of like the impact that this is having on my clients, um, you know, and the difficulty that it's having on my practice. Uh, it's, it's quite concerning, but really no one should be in immigration detention right now. Um, I, I agree with Bella. I think anyone who's in detention right now is unlawfully detained. And just to give an example while I'm there. So I did an immigration bail hearing yesterday by, by video link. I couldn't conference with my client and not without, I don't want to give out, give away too much confidential information, but essentially looking through his medical notes, he has, he's taking medication, which means that he's immunosuppressed. So basically he's got a, you know, a really dysfunctional immune system and they've got him in detention, you know, and they these people are still there and they, 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 they shouldn't be, you know, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. I'm going to move on to some of the questions now. Just on, I'm going to go to Steve Broach in a second because um, he's opted to answer one live. But just before I do, there's a question from Abigail Grace, um, which reads, is there a concern that people leaving detention won't have anywhere safe to go, given that a lot of support organisations are not functioning as normal at the moment? And I suppose that's a question for Bella, and also for Steve, as, uh, sorry, Steve Gallagher, Andrew. Yeah, th thanks so much for that question. I just, I just saw that one as well. I think that's uh, a really important point. It's definitely a concern. Um, in our litigation, we were saying that anyone released must be released to um, appropriate accommodation, which allows them to self-isolate or shield themselves if that's required. Um, but as I'm sure lots of you know, you know, uh, the state of asylum accommodation, um, section four accommodation is often really appalling. Um, and there's the, the similar kind of overcrowding and, and, and um, you know, problems there. Um, I mean, we're working with other kind of frontline organizations to try and ensure that despite these circumstances, uh, you know, destitution funds are still available and that, you know, there is still kind of frontline support for people either leaving detention or who are just street homeless um, because their appeal rights exhausted and, you know, that they've been street homeless for a while. Lots of people fall through the cracks. Often people will say that they have somewhere to go when they leave detention, but it may not be a, a long term option. You know, it's, it's staying with a friend or a family member and, and things go wrong or they end up sofa surfing and then end up on the streets. Um, I mean, government is now under kind of increasing obligations and instructions, local government from central government to house homeless people. Um, so I think, you know, pressure can be brought to bear, but I imagine that more strategic litigation is needed to, to deal with the issue of, um, uh, yeah, of, of potential destitution for people otherwise in detention. Thank you. Yeah. 
Go on. Uh, just very, very quickly add on to that. I know from a couple of colleagues that the, uh, we are still having people apply for bail in principle. So it does seem that, you know, the, the issues that we all know exist continue to exist. So there are by necessity people who are compelled to apply for bail in principle so that we can go away and then get them accommodation. So obviously this is a long standing issue, but, you know, hopefully with a little bit of more uh, impetus maybe you know those issues will be resolved but we'll see i think that's one that we need to watch certainly certainly um so steve broach you had flagged up a question there that you wanted to answer would you mind reading it and then giving us your answer to that absolutely so it's a really i think a really important question um if we think about practice issues um where the people may have seen i think celia celia kissinger um no, i've not pronounced her name correctly so, uh, as someone who was following the experience of users of online courts. Sorry, Steve, your volume's just coming in and out a little bit there. I'm so sorry. sorry. Well, seeing as I wasn't being particularly articulate at that point, I'm not too bothered. I'll try and start that again. There was a really interesting um, analysis on, uh, that we tweeted and uh, circulating quite widely recently about how very different uh, user experience of online courts can be compared to lawyers' experience. And there was a case in particular where the lawyers, and I, I completely understand this uh, in many ways, um, were celebrating the way they'd been able to achieve an online hearing and felt that it had been a, a, a remarkable success. But then when the, the user's experience was properly analysed, it had been anything but, and they had felt that it was um, almost disrespectful, I think, and not um, anything like what they anticipated uh, court proceedings would be dealing with... Um, as all our cases do, uh, incredibly sensitive issues by their nature. And I think that's just a really um, important point to keep in mind as we, as we celebrate the fact that technology is allowing us to continue to do our work, that it may feel very different for the, the people at the centre of it. And the question was, what can we do to help make someone's big day in court still feel serious and significant? And I, and I think the answer to that, and I've, I've been involved in quite a lot of these now, is to treat it like you're in court. And, and, you know, I, I don't say this lightly, not only dress properly from the waist up, you know, actually, like, prepare to be in court and treat it as if you are doing a court hearing. It just happens that you're talking to a computer screen instead of live to the, to the judge. But in all other respects, I think it should be as much as a, of a court experience as, as you can make it. And to show, you know, because it's that important point about showing our workings, isn't it? And showing our respect for the, the process and for what our clients and others are going through. And I, I, you know, I again utterly recognise that people will be in different situations and may not be able, particularly at the junior end, to be you know, in a nice quiet room on their own. And, you know, there are all sorts of practical difficulties, but to the extent we can, to behave as if we're in court, even if we're mediated by a screen, and to remember that for our clients, as always, it's one of the biggest days of their life. I think that's really key. So yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to chip in on that. And I don't think I'm saying anything very profound, but it's easy to forget, isn't it, when you're on, on a screen? What it Definitely. Is Undoubtedly it is. And I think it's one thing that it's always key to remember, especially as we try and get to grips and manage the madness of just trying to do that ourselves. It's easy to get um, totally encompassed by that, I think, and forget the reason why we're all here at the end of the day. Um, just, sorry, go ahead. But um, this is the new normal. This will keep going. I don't think this is going to stop anytime soon. Joe's probably got much more of an insight than, than I have. We need to get better at it. And I think it's forgivable to mess up the first few. I think there will be massive teething problems, but, but our job as practitioners, I think, is to, to improve and, and to help the, you know, the, the judiciary and to help the court service and to try and drive change from the bottom, which, which while I was always brilliantly done, you know, and, and to be exemplars probably for some of the older members of the profession who may be in a stereotype way less technologically savvy, that you can do this stuff well, mm -hmm. do it in a way that respects people. And Joe, do you want to come in on that a little bit as your specialist area? Is there anything else that you'd recommend? Very kind. Um, just on the back of Steve's point, I think that's really, really important to note that this, this has been in a pipeline for a long time. This is the HMCTS reform programme has been wanting to do this for quite a long time. So we should see this as part of a potentially part of a longer term project. Um, so which I think has two consequences. One, um, that there should be some really great monitoring built into how these processes are being rolled out, whether that's HMCTS um, 
whether they do that or whether this is this falls to civil society and NGOs um, and also uh, practitioners themselves just so we have a really sound evidence base for potentially then resisting the future um, the continu continuation of these remote processes beyond um, the pandemic so yes I think monitoring will be really really important during this stage and that's not something that's being built in at the moment um, but is vital because we don't particularly have a there's no sound evidence base at the minute for remote hearings um, and either yeah thank you okay that's enough from me <laughs> thank you very much joe and actually there's a question on the um the chat that i think is it's an immigration based question but it's probably applicable to all areas um certainly the first limb of it is um so it's from ellen lefley and she said um two immigration procedure specific questions number one what is everyone's view on the idea that there should be an assumption in the immigration asylum chamber that live evidence cannot be taken remotely from a non-controlled environment? So for example, as with out of country appeals. Now I suppose in anything that's remote, it is effectively non-controlled, isn't it? To a degree, like the court doesn't have eyes and ears into somebody's home. So it, are there any views on this among our panel as to whether or not there should be a presumption that actually live evidence cannot be taken in such circumstances and why? Anyone? <laughs> um, over to you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take it. Um, I, I, I don't profess to be an expert in this field, but I know that there was a lot of litigation that, uh, you know, Sonali Naik QC did, you know, for example, Kiari and Bin Loss, and the, and the case law that's come out from that, you know, Kiari and Bin Loss questions in the upper tribunal, um, where we've grappled significantly with, you know, sort of the, the difficulties with, with taking remote evidence. Uh, when I've dealt with some of this stuff in sort of, you know, sort of, you know, pre-litigation stage when we try to take evidence from overseas, what they want from a controlled environment is a guarantee that there's no one interfering with the process. So they, for example, want us to go to an embassy and have like embassy staff, in, you know, there, or they want us to be like in a, you know, sort of a five star hotel. That's the sort of level of control that they, you know, that the, the tribunal seems to want when they make these sort of requests and that that's why it becomes so difficult um the second point emanating out from the first part of that question is that um sorry i've just lost the question now um let me come back to it um yeah so so yeah so the second second point is is that like you know for those of us who do immigration bail hearings you know yourself the difference it makes when you've got your client in court with you and when you've got your client on a video link I mean, I, I, anecdotally, I know that that makes a difference in terms of whether I secure bail or not for that client. Um, if I could briefly just touch on the second question of the, um, the, you know, the, the, the question of uh, the, the mandating skeleton argument in advance. I think they've been trialing this for a while now. There has been a pilot uh, that's been ongoing. And I do think that there is some potential benefit from it um you know potential benefit in terms of like it, it, it encourages the parties to focus their arguments it encourages the parties to cooperate with one another and in theory it encourages the parties to come to a resolution or at least like cuts down on the amount of needless um labor um certainly like there's more than one occasion in my short career where i've turned up on the day and the home office have withdrawn which is really annoying when you've prepared a case so in that respect i think it's potentially good the problem that we have is on fixed fee cases, we don't get paid. So as counsel, uh, on a fixed fee case, I don't mind telling you this, it's, you know, it's in the legal aid regulations, I get paid £302. Now pretty much, what, no matter what I do, it's very rare for a fixed fee case to escape. They, that's what they call it, where it goes hourly. So basically I get paid 302 quid. If I do half an hour's work on it, I get paid 302 quid. If I do 12 hours work on it and I travel six hours to Newport and back and spend three hours in court waiting and have an hour's conference with my client, which is not unusual, I get paid 302 quid and I can deal with that. But the problem with the current system is, is that they say they want a skeleton argument. And if you're good at that skeleton argument and that case resolves without an oral yeah. hearing, you get paid. So it's like a dis disincentive of like, you know, the better you are at your job, the less chance you've got of being paid and they can't you know, you can't make that sustainable. They have to do something about that. But beyond that, the principle has potential. Can I chip in on a, a, a really powerful points you're making at the end there, Stephen, about um, 
practice for us and for the junior end in particular are getting stuffed for being good. But um, can I just go back to the first half of the question as a complete non-immigration practitioner, but as a, as, a, as a discrimination practitioner, and just observe how striking it is to hear you talking, Stephen, and to even hear the question about the level of distrust of people in the immigration context and the arrangements are, are made and imposed in that context that would never be dreamed of in other contexts. And so where there is differential treatment of that sort, of course, it needs to be justified, doesn't it? And so the question will be, well, what's the justification? And, and is, it, is it excessive? Is it disproportionate? Because most of, we'll be well aware, most of equality law is, is essentially hinged on the question of proportionality. Um, and it seems to me, as someone who doesn't know what he's talking about, like there's at least a, a risk that there's disproportionality in here. And those who do know what they're talking about in that space might want to explore that. And if a more proportionate solution could be put forward to take account of the, the current crisis, um, that would obviously be useful, wouldn't it? So there'll be a bunch of immigration lawyers instructing you very soon, Steve. <laughs> well, that's um, on the basis that I know yeah. nothing about immigration law. <laughs> Uh, we've got to some remote hearings as well and um, yeah. I mean we're very opposed to remote hearings in all uh, in all contexts uh, when it comes to immigration substantive immigration cases um, you know obviously these are really unprecedented times and we're not opposed to um, remote hearings when it comes to bail applications because I think that's all all we can have at the moment and I think if it's a choice between that and, and no option where you're trying to safeguard people's liberty, then of course that has to be kind of the least worst option and it should be pursued. And as I mentioned earlier, the evidence is that they're actually going pretty well from a human rights perspective. Um, I guess one kind of note of caution is because, because of the times that we're in, it's not surprising that lots of people are getting their bail granted and that, and I hope that that doesn't then become an argument and a justification for these becoming more the norm um, because I think it is very much on the grounds that people cannot be removed from the country so therefore they need to be released from detention um, but I would be really concerned about the creep I mean you know even even in the best case scenarios where clients are present in, in court uh, or in the tribunal we know that people really struggle that you know there's huge issues with mental capacity often um you know others, others have mentioned interpretation um that there, there can be so many barriers um to people effectively kind of accessing the process understanding the process following it and making their best contribution to it um, the idea of, of, of routinely this being done by by video link i think is just a nightmare and a recipe for injustice um, so i think that that's something that we really need to guard against i mean we don't see a reason why the UK can't, uk can't do as portugal and for the time being anybody that has got insecure status or he, who is undocumented is just given a, a temporary reprieve that we just um, press pause on on seeking to actually progress any substantive immigration cases i mean look at what else we've managed to press pause on or or do a sort of massive pivot on as a nation uh, this is really small fry in comparison to um you know the, the various economic measures that are being announced every day um, and so I, you know, I, I would be really keen to have a wider, get a wider campaign going for that uh, so that we can just remove this, this need for video link for substantive immigration hearings altogether for the time being. I completely agree with absolutely everything Berger just said and I would totally endorse that, that we, should, we should be doing like Portugal. Can I raise a, um, a different perspective from a disability rights perspective though, uh, just on the on the broader question of, of whether this is a good way forward and whether what we're going to learn from this crisis, because I've certainly experienced that remote justice can be more accessible for some of my clients. You know, people who physically can't get to court, for example, because of uh, impairments and the inaccessible nature of a lot of our court estate, or who have autism, for example, and would just find the environment totally overwhelming, but could join if it's mediated through a screen. So it's, it's, again, it's not one size fits all, isn't it? Nothing I'm saying is, is intended to undermine anything that's just been said about the injustices in, in other areas, and obviously in immigration detention would be one of them. But I think where, for example, if you're bringing a judicial review for a disabled client, um, and it would just be assumed now that they wouldn't come to court in many cases. Well, why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they be joining remotely? Even if everyone else is there, why can't they join remotely? So I hope there can be some positive learning out of this crisis, you know, if, if and when we get to the other side and there is an old normal back, 
perhaps it, perhaps it can be a slightly more accessible old normal. And a lot of disabled people on Twitter have been saying what you guys are now experiencing is what we've experienced for a long time. And you're having to, you're, now it's the majority that are locked down and are shut at home. Solutions are being found. Well, yeah, fair comment, I'd say. And perhaps what that might lead to is a, is a rollout of more accessible measures moving forward generally. Definitely, Steve. Um, definitely. And we did actually receive feedback um, when we put out this event to say um, from a number of perspectives, not just disability, but also um, people with caring responsibilities as well, that they enjoyed the fact that this was going to be remote because it makes it just so much more accessible. Um, and so def definitely, definitely, that's so important. Um, we've got a couple of kind of criminal questions and I don't know if anybody is going to be able to answer these specifically. I think, um, Joe, you might be in a position to answer this one. It's from Katrina McLaughlin and she says, um, we can't get into prisons to see our clients and prisons are refusing to allow us to use the video link like pro probation can. Is anything being done to see if we could use Skype link for prison visits or are there any talks with prison and HMCTS on how solicitors can still take instructions and see those who are in prison? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't have an answer, unfortunately. I do know the Home Office hasn't got Skype for Business working yet, um, which is interesting. Um, and there's an interesting geography around how different um, detention centres and prisons and tribunal and courts link up or don't link up. Um, which has been an unexpected finding recently. Apparently you can't do any video link hearings from um, Birmingham IAC on Wednesdays, but you can every other day of the week. So, um, and that, that was pre-corona, but um, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, sort of geography to all of this. And yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have any more of a substantive answer to that, but. Yeah. No, no problem at all. I mean, does anybody else have anything that they'd like to chip in on that or should I move on to the next one? Yeah, move on. Um, okay, so we've got some general questions about the types of platforms being used. I mean, I'll just answer that one. It varies from court to court and jurisdiction to jurisdiction, which is part of the, the difficulty, of course, that Joe was talking about in, in your speech there, is that there's, there needs to be uniform guidance, there needs to be a consistent way of working that's really important. Um, Zabetta, I'm so sorry, Zabetta, I'm totally going to mess up your surname, so I'm just not going to do it. Um, but you ask, and I assume that this is a question for Bella Sankey. Um, hello, should it be found that those in immigration detention are being unlawfully detained? What is the best remedy we can hope to offer them in the future? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I guess in, in the normal way, um, you know, people may well have individual unlawful detention claims. Um, and, you know, we, we're certainly <clears throat> making referrals um, to public law solicitors, um, particularly for those that are long term detained. Um, we've got clients that have been in detention since October 2018. <laughs> um, so, so 18 month detentions, um, including people who are removable to the list of countries that I mentioned. So I think there's there's obviously some really strong cases for unlawful um, unlawful detention um, across the piece in the detention estate. Um, I guess our you know our immediate priority though is is trying to get people out as urgently as possible, which is why um, you know it may be the case that bail app, you know given the success of bail applications in the last few weeks, it may be that that's kind of the immediate, you know, the best kind of immediate course um, and then com combined with our strategic litigation. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think I think that's probably the best thing to say. I mean, one thing just to mention, we're, we are concerned um, just in terms of kind of general human rights obligations and Article 2 and Article 3 obligations. I mean, that was one of the grounds of, that's one of the grounds of our challenge. Um, and we did um, get expert evidence from a um, public health um, epidemiologist with a specialism in detention settings who said that based on the government's kind of plan for detention and their guidance, the risk, you know, if a case does come into detention, there's a, 60, a risk of 60% of the population getting COVID-19, which is obviously incredibly high and very worrying. Um, we're also concerned that the Home Office isn't 
doesn't seem to be routinely testing people in detention that are exhibiting symptoms and they seem to be relying on PHE guidance that you know um, even if you've got symptoms you just um, kind of sweat it out for seven days and then it's only if, if your symptoms worsen that you might be tested. I would argue that if you're being forcibly detained and you exhibit symptoms there's an obligation on the state to test you at an earlier stage and we have had one very worrying report of somebody who was quarantined. So what the detention centres have been doing is effectively cohorting together people that are exhibiting symptoms. Um, so seemingly with a view of removing them from the rest of the population, but not necessarily effectively protecting those people. Um, and we know that there was a so-called quarantine wing at Harmonsworth um, a few weeks ago. And we've heard that somebody was released from that wing directly home. Um, without being tested as we understand it and then immediately died on returning home uh, so we're just trying to investigate that further but um, first instance that does raise concerns that 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 um, person's health and rights have not been properly safeguarded so that's something that we want to p pursue I guess my hope is that it's unlawful detention claims that are being brought and not article two and three claims um, when this is all over Absolutely. And actually, there is a question uh, from an anonymous attendee on um, asking for the panel's thoughts on the chief coroner's recent guidance that says that no inquest hearings should not take place where the coroner is physically present in court, as otherwise the hearings could, would not be public. Um, I, I don't suppose that there's really the expertise on the panel, unless somebody particularly wants to take that one up. Um, um, go on then, Steve. Thank you. Again, as someone who doesn't practice in inquest law, one, I just felt off about that as well. Uh, what, I, what I am very conscious of, though, is that um, restrictive policies like that are potentially discriminatory. And of course, there have been some quite interesting discrimination claims around coroners recently. And um, a blanket ban is always something that discrimination lawyers will want to look at very, very closely and, and will want to see justification for. And I'm not aware, and it may be that I'm just literally not aware of it, but of a rule that says that for a hearing to be public, any person has to be physically present in a particular place. That seems quite surprising to me. I'd want to see the basis for that in, in statute or otherwise. Um, so I would again encourage inquest lawyers to essentially push back about that because mm -hmm. it, it, um, it doesn't feel right to me. And I suppose if I've learned anything in my practice, it's that if things don't feel right, there's a decent chance they're unlawful. So it would be worth um, worth giving that one a go. I think. Follow your nose. <laughs> exactly. It's not, it's, not, it's not rocket science, all this stuff, is it? Absolutely. Um, we've got another question for an anonymous uh, attendee. This one might be for you, Steve uh, Gulliver Andrew. Um, equally, anybody, obviously, feel free to, to um, go in on this one. Uh, perhaps a bit of a selfish question. I don't think it is a selfish question. I think it's a question on a lot of people's lips who are just coming into the profession, actually. Um, so please don't, don't say that it's a selfish question or, or in any way um, apologise for asking it. I think it's important. I have recently left my job as a legal researcher to qualify for the bar. I'm sure many listening are younger legal, legal practitioners. The future's been looking quite grim for a long time now. And with an impending recession, do you have any advice for those in early career? Over to you, Steve G.A. I mean... It's, it's a very tough question and I think it's a very personal question as well. Um, I guess, you know, the, you know, the, the bar is, is very much a, you know, it's a vocation and if you want to do it, you want to do it and no one's going to sort of tell you otherwise, I think, you know, for the people who've got that far. Uh, nevertheless, it's always, you know, even at the best of times, it's a difficult path to embark on. Uh, for me, I got pupillage seven years after I'd finished my law degree and I'd done a lot of different things in my time. So when I came to the bar, I came with a lot of sort of, you know, I, I was kind of in demand. I had loads of skills and experiences that I brought. So I guess for, for people who are sort of looking to go, you know, to make that step right now. Um, I mean, I, I, for example, when I graduated in 2010, I graduated in the aftermath of the financial crisis. This is prom like, looks like it's going to be more severe than that. But, you know, there are peaks and troughs in everything. And this is like, if this is a long-term goal that you have, then no one's really going to take that away from you. I just would suggest maybe be flexible about when you get it and think about what, if you're not getting it straight away, what you might be able to do to kind of jump up that ladder and up that stack of papers in the meantime. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Does anybody else want to add anything? I'll, I'll, can I chip in my wise old owl bit, Kiara? Please and, and, do. And sort of hopefully say something very helpful. Um, I, I was also quite late, well, very late coming to the bar. I had a whole other career first. I didn't do pupils until I was 30. And it was quite striking, actually, that I was the youngest pupil just in, in my set out of five at 30. So, you know, I know it feels ancient to some people on the school, I'm sure, and it is. Uh, but it's the bar is a, is a long term game, isn't it? And we all are going to be working those who practice at the bar. And I'm sure same for many solicitors as well until we're whatever, you know, 70 if we're lucky. Um, I wouldn't feel like there's any kind of tearing hurry. And if you don't feel like now is exactly the right time because, you know, the world's been turned upside down, feel free to do something else first. There's no rush. No, I think it's brilliant, Stephen, telling us that seven years after his law degree, he's being pupilaged. And that's the, for me, that feels about right. It's really, really hard being a barrister, isn't it? It's really hard being a solicitor. I'm not trying to create a hierarchy. I think doing legal work is incredibly tough. And we're just beginning to get to grips with um, issues around well-being, like just beginning, I think, to get to grips with it. There's this amazing organisation, Claiming Space, that's promoting well-being issues for young lawyers who do work with traumatised clients and, and the kind of vicarious trauma that a lot of us get in all sorts of different areas, probably every area that's represented on, on this panel. You know, you're working with people who are in incredibly difficult situations and it's tough. So all, all that to say, don't feel like you're in some kind of sprint. It's not. And if you don't want to start now, that seems eminently sensible. If you've got a nice, a secure other option to do, whether it's research or um, an NGO or whatever it might be, do that for now, if that makes you feel better, and then do the bar later on or start the bar, but accept that it might not be forever and do something else and then potentially come back to it. I think there's a lot more fluidity now. I know a number of people who've been at the bar, gone and done something else, perhaps in the, in the NGO sector, come back part-time, maybe a bit of academia. You know, it's, it's not that kind of golden escalator, if there ever was one, it's not, it's not how it is for anybody. So I, would, I know it's hard at the moment and, um, it's the, the, the worst thing in the world is to say, just relax, just relax, it'll be okay. You know, it might not be okay, but I think it's, it's going to be more likely to be okay if we can avoid putting unnecessary pressure on ourselves as well to achieve certain milestones. And that pressure never goes away. It's just, just changes as your career progresses. But if we can all just take that down a notch and um, try and look after ourselves and, and be in the best shape we can be to actually help the people that we're all doing it for, then that's a success, I think, in whatever capacity we're doing. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to pull on, on something. There was a question um, from a student, I, I think it seems, um, in the question. It, it was about student loans company. I don't think it's anything that we'll be able to really answer in the scope of this Q&A. Um, but what I did want to say at the beginning and totally forgot was that we are looking for contributors um, to evidence from students. And so if you can get in touch with us, um, our email address is info at gmail.com um, and just in a 200 word short summary just tell us kind of what your experience is and um, kind of the, the difficulties that you're facing we would be extremely grateful for that. Um, on the subject of um, bringing it down a notch and taking it a little bit slowly I did want to finish off um, which is a, I've gone a bit rogue here and I, I know that none of the other presenters knew that I was going to do this uh, but I want to I want to finish off with a poem um, that was actually sent to me by a solicitor called Josie Hicklin and she's a trainee solicitor at Greater Manchester Law Centre. She's an absolute diamond. Uh, she's also a yoga teacher as well and it's a poem specifically on lockdown and I recommend um, hearing it with your eyes closed. That's not for everybody and I don't expect the presenters to necessarily do that but I'm going to read it to you now. Here we go. If I can just get my tech to work. Oh, hang on, hang on. Got to, I've got to go on WhatsApp for this. Sorry, guys. It'll just be a second. Yara, shall I busk for you for a second? Because Oh, a great yeah, question. go ahead, Steve. I'd there's love that. Thank you. Someone's just asked uh -huh. the most amazing question, which is what might pupillages be like in the autumn? Oh, God. Anyone, anyone who has any idea what the answer to that question is probably potentially in the, <laughs> in the market for a lot of money, I would have thought, of the bookies. 
Worth their weight in gold, no doubt. <laughs> great question, isn't it? Because, you know, these are people's careers that are supposed to be about to start. I think the, the answer to that is obviously you need to be liaising with individual chambers and, and different practice areas is going to feel very, very different, I think. Um, I mean, actually, yeah. as a public lawyer who does an awful lot of work that doesn't involve going to court very often, um, because a lot of jails settles, people know, um, it doesn't feel that different to me at the moment. And I can imagine being a public law, like a straight public law pupil and it not being, it being weird, but not completely different. In other areas, it will be utterly different slash impossible to be a pupil. Um, crime is the one that most obviously springs to mind, isn't it? So I think you're going to need to work very closely with the chambers and try and understand what, what they are going to be able to do, but probably not yet because mm -hmm. we just have no idea. Well, thank you so much for busking there, Steve, and doing so, so gracefully. Um, I've now got the poem. Um, Josie, being the complete star that she is, has just resent it to me. <laughs> um, it's called Lockdown, and it's by a poet called Richard Hendrick. And here it goes. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But... They say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and grey and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. They say that a hotel in the west of Ireland is offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy spreading flyers with her number through the neighborhood so that the elders may have someone to call on. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques and temples are preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, to how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray and we remember that, yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation, but there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be a rebirth of love. Wait to the choices you make as to how you live now. Today, breathe. Listen behind the factory noises of your panic. The birds are singing again, the sky is clearing, spring is coming, and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul, and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. And so I just want to end on that and really, really cheesily say to everybody, if you ever find yourself in need of somebody and just want to reach out, while Al are just here across the empty square for you, as always. Um, and thank you so much to all of our speakers. You have been really tremendous. Thank you. Big round of applause from me. And thank you to everybody who has participated, asked questions and watched and been here with us. Um, really, really grateful. So uh, that's it from me. Amazing. Goodbye, everyone. Unless you've got anything more to say. <laughs> thank thank you, you very much for having us. Thanks so much. Thank it was great. Anytime. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Cheers.